rich princes and fast cars and deserts and camels and things like that. that. People are so unkind and sensitive and inhumane. We restricted lifestyle. It is a country governed by, by harsh laws. Oil could be found everywhere. Somewhere over in the Middle East somewhere. Very, very hot. Obviously there's the abaya, you know, there's things like this. Sometimes there's the head covering or, you know, whatever. I think the big deal is actually the, how women are, are treated. Camels, sun, desert, Mercedes, oil, thobes. But I didn't know they were called thobes. Rich Saudis, basically, who drive around in Mercedes and Rolls Royces. The whole issue of Al-Qaeda, and especially after 9-11. Camels, desert, dates, thobe. Camping, tents, uh, then shisha. A lot of this is linked, of course, to an enormous amount of negative publicity in Western press about Saudi Arabia, which has, as we know, increased quite significantly this year. I think the black propaganda uh, portrayed by media about terrorism and inhumane treatment are abuses. It was media driven and all the decade of 1990s and then afterwards 9-11 and the subsequent events and then this Islamophobia, right? And the uh, uh, very strong image created by Hollywood movies and then the Western press and certain news channels. That some of it is because of the media. Uh, I think the hype that the, the media has, has put into it is probably a little bit overblown in terms of that. Media world that has all these perceptions, you know, negative perceptions probably about Saudi Arabia and the area, you know. There are so many stereotypes in the Western world about Saudi Arabia. So uh, some of them you get influenced by them and you start thinking like them because you have never been here. So you, you just go with those perceptions in a way. The control of of media outlets uh, has narrowed tremendously. Um, you have a lot of interests. You, know. the, you could use the, the, the way the, the media show Saudi Arabia as a bit of a veil in itself because it's hiding the reality. No, a lot of people, I think a lot of people wondered why I was coming and um, you know, what the sort of rationale was. You would come to Saudi Arabia to earn a lot of money uh, because you don't have to pay tax like we do in, uh, back home uh, and that you would get a better salary here and that that was a sort of, you know, the, the reason why most people would come and I think that's maybe why a lot of people thought that I was coming. People just thought it sounded like a great adventure <laughs> but actually one of the things um, that people got confused about is that I told them I was going to Saudi Arabia and they kept on saying to me, so you're going to Dubai, aren't you? No, I'm not going to Dubai. You're going, I'm going to Saudi Arabia. Oh, yes, of course, I remember. So, um, and then a few days later, they go, and how is it going to be in Abu Dhabi? What? I'm not going to Abu Dhabi. I'm going to Saudi Arabia. It's slightly different. Uh, and then somebody would say something like, Oh, I hear it's great in Dubai. You're going to have such a fantastic time. I said, it's not quite like Dubai in Saudi Arabia, actually. So a lot of it was just sort of confusion about geography and the difference between the UAE and maybe Qatar and, and Saudi. So... Uh, they were very concerned. Uh, and I had to remind them that I have basically travel to many countries in the world. My father, who is 90, and my son, who is in his early 20s and um, knows that life is not always what it seems, um, were concerned. And I think that they are still concerned. But then my mother, when I started telling her, you know, why not stay in Taiwan? You know, uh, I love Taiwan. I was there for 10 years and, and I told her Saudi Arabia and she was certainly kind of uh, worried, you know, at least initially, you know, maybe still, I don't know. I 
mind. I wasn't really bothered about what other people thought. You know, I thought, no, this is, you know, I would actually quite like to go and sort of make up my own mind. But again, you know, it, it's going back to these sort of general stereotypes that a lot of people have. Okay, well, I mean, ever since living here, my perceptions changed completely um, because, you know, of, of, you know, obviously I gather, you know, I gain knowledge about what the Saudi Arabia is really like in very, you know, lots of different parts of Saudi Arabia. I haven't just lived here in the eastern province. I've lived in Riyadh, I've lived in Jeddah, I've traveled and done research right around the kingdom. Um, and I mean, I think there's a lot of things that I didn't, I wasn't aware of before that have certainly changed my my, you know, the way I see the country. And I think, for example, something that's not at all known in the West, you know, is the fact of how important humour is in Saudi Arabia. I think the, the kindness that, you know, I've, I've travelled, we've gone to, you know, Najran, and being invited into people's homes. And, uh, you know, we, we were camping on some man's farm and he, he came out, he's like, you know, we had broken Arabic and he had, you know, very broken English and our Arabic was probably even more broken than his English. And he's kind of like, what are you doing? You know, we're, we had our tent. We're like, oh, can't, you know, it's okay. You know, he's like, okay, you know. So here's a, okay, you're camping, you're on my land, but okay, it's okay. For example, I hear frequently you know, there's no such thing as civil society in Saudi Arabia. Uh, that's something I've heard lots and lots of times. Well, of course, we know that that's nonsense. There is civil society here, of course there is, but it's not the Western version of civil society. It's the Saudi version of civil society because this is Saudi Arabia, yes? So I think, you know, this is, this is a very, very important point. You can't understand a culture, you know, unless you actually look at that culture, you know, in its own context. And I think, you know, this understanding of local context, and then in the case of Saudi Arabia, it's not just enough as well. Basically, Saudi culture is very unique in some ways. I think what I love the most is that the family bonding is very intact, okay? Very kind, friendly people, and very family oriented, which is sadly not the same in the U.S. You know, I mean, we, are, we, we like family, you know, but, you know, when you're, we're 18, we kind of leave home and we, you know, yeah, hi mom, hi dad, but it's not really, you know, as close. Family ties are not as strong as they are here, for example. I feel Saudi Arabia is a very safe place to live uh, for people having family or raising a family. It's a very good place to raise your kids in a way. Uh, I never feel scared walking at night in a street or in a mall. You can go and have jogging on Coronation Khobar or the Mam. Uh, uh, 1 a.m. Still, you feel very safe. Uh, nobody will c come and snatch your mobile and ask for your purse or something. Given the way that the political situation has passed, sort of panned out in this in the Middle East over the last year. I feel safer here than I might feel in many places in Europe. And in general, Saudis are very respectful towards women, right? Like at a checkpoint, if your family is with you, they won't stop you. If there's one big misperception that I've discovered, is that people think that because Saudi women are covered up completely when they're outside, that that somehow makes them sort of browbeaten and timid and, you know, weak and vacillating and not sure of themselves and I have realized from teaching for the last year and the people that I've met that that's completely not the case um, and, and that if anything I think Saudi women are the most, some of the strongest women I've ever come across in my life, you know, they know what they want, they know how to get it, they're going to organize the men so that they will get it. Uh, once I went to teaching hospital, I had some uh, sinus problems. Uh, the, the female ENT specialist, Saudi specialist, really took very good care of me in investigations and then follow-ups. And I told my students that your female doctors are more competent than the female do uh, than the male doctors. So that was also a very good, very positive perception. 
Then I believe in Panda and other supermarkets. Female checkout points are faster than the male checkout points. So I think they are coming up. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. They're willing to take over, which is a positive thing. But, but you know, nobody's ever looked after me for the last 40 years. I've got children who are nearly 30 now, and I brought them up by myself and have completely supported them. Their father did not. So um, I don't know what it means to be looked after. I think that the assumption is that if women have to be covered up all the time, that somehow that's because men don't like women. I mean, it, it was quite frightening, actually, thinking that you're in a country where you probably were disliked because you were a woman. Um, but, but what I realized then that was that there's still a very strong sense of chivalry in Saudi. Chivalry is, is, is the, the, the urge that allows men to look after women, that to, to, to make sure that they're all right. And this has really been, a lot of it has been got rid of in the West, yeah? So I realized after a while that actually Saudi men were very chivalrous and as well as charming. So, but, but the one thing that really sort of brought this home to me was that I got into a taxi one night down, right down at the Corniche, having been shopping and gave it what I thought were instructions to my compound. But the man who drove me was Saudi, but he didn't speak English, so he didn't really understand me. And the only thing that he understood in my instruction was Holiday Inn. Now, at that point, I didn't know that there were two Holiday Inns in Koba, and he took me to the wrong one. We had no way of explaining that he was at the wrong one and where the right one was, because I didn't know where I was, because when somebody drives you everywhere, you never find out where you are, so you never have any sense of direction. And, you know, this is, I'm not used to this. And in the end, we had to stop the car. I was in tears by this time, because I couldn't, you know, I was, I just couldn't make myself understood, and he didn't understand. And he called a guy who was walking in the street. He'd just come out of the compound, the Saudi guy. And he said, listen, this woman is, is, is trying to find the Holiday Inn in Koba and in the other Holiday Inn, but I don't know of another Holiday Inn. I don't know why, but he just didn't. And that guy actually oh, said, get out of the car, I'll sort you out, it'll all be all right. And he, he, he said to the taxi driver, off you go, you go, and I will make sure that she's okay. He hauled another taxi up, he made sure that the taxi knew exactly where I was going, he put me in the taxi and made sure that I was okay. Um, which, and then I suddenly realized that the whole point about the whole thing of women being protected and looked after is that when things like that happen, somebody steps in, whether it's your father or not, isn't, you know, neither here nor there, the men here will make sure that, or at least with me anyway, um, make sure that you're all right. Other perceptions, other things that I encountered were, you know, students offering me rides, for example. I remember being off campus. I don't have a car. And, you know, students, even students I don't even teach, somehow they know, ah, oh, you're KFUPM, I'm a KFUPM student, you know. I don't know you personally, but here, let me give you a ride here, you know, and just the friendliness of the people. 70% of the population is under 30, and today are very well educated, interconnected with the world, online. My my daughter, who's now four, we talked about names for her, and I wanted something that would overlap, would intermesh. A few days back, there was a guy, I supervised his uh, internship thesis, even I know his name before he entered my office and I know I told he said who I am I said Bara so Bara Talmasani so uh, he was a marketing graduate and he comes to me and says look sir it's my wedding and you must come and I asked him you still recall me yes he said very well so that is something that really connects you with the people and the society uh, we came up with the name uh, Jasmine which is Yasmin in Arabic and so you know, when she's older and she understands a bit more, and, um, 
I'll tell her these stories and I'll tell her, we'll tell her where her name comes from and, and she'll remember. Today, uh, uh, an ex-student came to uh, university and he, I, I just saw him in the corridors. He came and he kissed me on one side and the other side. So this is something very good in a way, but I get confused with it because I think the people in the West, they uh, kiss on one side continuously, one, two, three, four, right? And in other parts, it's one, two, three. So it's, it's always, I, I get confused. Now this guy will go on the other side, it will, but this is a good thing. This bring, brings you closer to the people. Then, of course, uh, kissing the head of the elders, this is something very moving. As I'm British, there is, we have, of course, a very distinct way of looking at time. And, you know, for us, being punctual, being on time. If somebody says, come at 7.30, we're there at 7.20, for example. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and this is sort of, you know, this is, you know this, is, this is terribly important for us, yes? Of course, my Saudi friends very often will say to me, oh, let's go out for supper tonight. And I'll say, yes, that's great. And they say, oh, right, so we'll, we'll see you about nine o'clock. And I say, fine, I'll be there at 11. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I think this is, you know, I think that it's, 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 uh, it's very interesting because it's a different concept of time, you know? I know you're waiting for this. <laughs> Driving. <laughs> it is truly the most dangerous thing in Saudi Arabia. If I'm afraid of anything, it is people driving in Saudi Arabia. Nothing else. Just that. Very dangerous. And something I've seen a lot in my first few years, not much lately, fortunately, is you could, have, you could be on a big road with multiple lanes. You could have you know, two or more lanes on each side. And you could have someone on the far right and they want to turn left over here. You know, in other countries, they'll just gradually go to the next lane, next lane, and then they'll turn at the next available. No, 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 no. They'll go now. So they'll just cut across like four lanes of traffic. No, in, no, no signal indicator. They'll just go, you know. And it's like, uh, interesting, you know. That's an interesting approach, you know. <laughs> and so... You know, this perception of the veil actually being disempowering, I found that very interesting. I've talked to girls who I know find the veil very useful in Miles, for example, when they're eyeing up the talent. The veil is very useful when you can do an awful lot of eyeing up the talent. Do you not understand what I mean by that? No. Guy watching. <laughs> so the girls are going around, they're covered in black. <laughs> and they're eyeing all the guys. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, you know, you think you're wandering around and nobody's noticing you, but let me tell you, it's not like that. <laughs> Just don't edit this so I sound like Donald Trump. <laughs> 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 like, that's completely out of context. <laughs>